um, in the Ariane family of launches. And uh, Raphael, she has got an incredible track record, hasn't she, of success? Yeah, this is a very reliable and successful, successful rocket. Uh, Webb is going to be the 112th Ariane 5 to be launched. And the, first, the very first Ariane, the Ariane 1, took off exactly 42 years ago. Yesterday, this was on Christmas Eve 1979. Good symbol. Yeah, and hopefully we're going to get a good Christmas present today as well. And I mean, the, the rocket is also, you don't get to build a, a, a rocket like this without collaboration either, do you? Of course, just like Web, actually. Uh, in fact, 12 different countries have been participating in the development of the RN5, with Aryan Group now being the industrial prime. And we have a scale model right next to you, Raphael. Why don't you talk us through it? The, the rocket is made of sections, and we often call those stages, which is what you might hear during the commentary. Exactly. So first you have the two boosters, solid boosters, that are located on each side of the rocket. They will provide the main thrust in order to literally push the rocket against the gravity of the Earth. Then you have these big tanks that form the um, main cryogenic stage with the main engine Vulcan at the bottom. And then you have the Webb telescope right at the top inside the fairing. It is right there on the launch pad and together they are put on top of the third stage, a cryogenic stage. And it is this upper stage that is going to place Webb into orbit. And what about the engines? What are we going to see at liftoff? At liftoff, we first see the main Vulcan engine uh, ignite first. Uh, we do this because we want to check its, pro its working properly before we switch on the solid boosters seven seconds uh, later. Uh, once it's done, there is no turning back. The rocket is going to lift off. And so, yeah, uh, that's uh, very, uh, uh, don't be surprised. Don't be surprised if you don't, if you don't see the rocket lifting up for seven seconds. That's time for the rocket to actually warm up before soaring into the sky. <laughs> so once we light the touch paper, you can count to seven uh, before it actually lifts off. Now, one of the advantages of the Ariane 5 vehicle is that it can be modified. And that's exactly what we've done for today's launch. We've um, had to make some changes for it to be able to host the web satellite. And joining me to talk about that is somebody who, the right person for the job indeed, because he was in charge of those uh, changes, Daniel de Chambre from the European Space Agency. Thanks for joining us, Daniel. What did you have to do? First, we need to recall that Webb will be the largest payload to be ever accommodated on, uh, on I-5. It fully occupies the volume of the fairing with gaps as small as 10 centimeter for a diameter of five meter. It is the reason why we had to develop a specific integration procedure to ensure that there is no contact with them. After separation, uh, during separation, sorry, uh, the venting system of, uh, of the launcher has been improved in order to balance as much as possible the inside and the outside pressure of, of the fairing. And this is to, to, um, due to the fear of a depressurization shock, which could damage the delicate layers of uh, web summer sun shield. After separation, uh, the, uh, due to the fact that uh, web, some equipment of web are very sensitive to sun exposure, the, um, uh, the role control of the launcher will be tuned in order to make sure that web is always oriented only one face to, to the sun. And uh, in addition, to avoid any old spot, uh, the launcher will be crea uh, will create some oscillating movement, like a barbecue mode, to avoid any over overheating. And after after web separation, uh, there will be a specific end of flight maneuver to uh, to be applied on the upper stage in order to put it on a liberation orbit around the sun in order to avoid collision in the in the long term. Thank you very much indeed, Daniel. So we'll hopefully see the uh, upper stage rocking in space, not quite all the way around like the familiar barbecue, but a slightly different movement. And listen, gentlemen, thank you very much indeed for being with us today. Uh, I know that you're busy. You've got jobs to do inside the fishbowl, so I'm going to send you right back there now and very best wishes for the launch. Thank you. Thank you. Our telescope has a long journey ahead of it. It's got to travel a million miles 
to its destination in space, its working zone, where it's going to start telling us all about our universe. It's already started that journey um, because it's traveled to the launch pad from Los Angeles after final tests were concluded in Los Angeles. Webb was packed. Hey guys, I uh, hope you can hear me okay uh, and see me all right. Um, Merry Christmas, everybody. Welcome. Merry Christmas. This is uh, an exciting time. We are getting ready for the launch of JWST. NASA is doing a great job uh, with the. It's doing a great job with the coverage here. I'm going to try and do my best to go back and forth uh, with uh, their coverage plus mine, um, and we can share this together. I just that's the whole reason for doing this. I want to thank you for getting up on Christmas morning. It's uh, at least it's Christmas morning here. The sun has only just now come up here in Central Florida, uh, and um, I, many of you watching in Europe, it's already afternoon, so I hope you're having a good Christmas day, and I, I'm, not a, I'm not a morning lark, so this the only time I ever see sunrises is, is if I've been up all night, <laughs> so, uh, so anyway, uh, please forgive me if I'm a little bit distracted, and because there's a lot for me to keep track of here, and... Um, uh, I got. I want to also not miss anything, so I've got my headphones kind of right here. You shouldn't be listening to the NASA stream right now, just me, and I can go back and forth. See, so watch. And then fueling started, and of course. So if something uh, begins to happen with the launch countdown or whatever, I will switch over and we'll both be on. Uh, but um, uh, we got a lot to look forward to today. So the launch is scheduled for 7.20. There's a 30-some-odd window. 30-minute uh, window of, uh, of opportunity for um, the launch to happen today. Uh, and, um, and so I'm going to stream from, the, from now until about um, 1.30 GMT or 8.30 my time, because it is Christmas Day, I got to get going. <laughs> and uh, uh, I want to stop after the solar deployment. So one of the things I want to I show you here um, is... Um, let me pull, let me pull this up. Um, this is a, uh, part of the NASA webpage. Uh, if you go to jwst.nasa.gov, there's a nice deployment, uh, explorer here where you can see all of the different parts of the deployment process. It's going to take a full 29 days to fully deploy, uh, uh, the web space telescope and get it out to L2 which as you've been hearing on the NASA stream is a million and a half miles away. Or, I'm sorry, a million and a half kilometers away, a million miles away. Uh, but what you can do is you can see the different, you can explore the different parts of the deployment. Um, this is what we're waiting on now, which was lit, which is liftoff. And then uh, at about 27 minutes after launch, they're going to uh, separate the uh, upper stage and remove the... Uh, um, well, the actually the, the the fairings will probably be, we get released. Uh, well, yeah, about 20, um, 26 minutes after launch, and then uh, this upper upper fairing will separate, and then finally for today anyway, this solar array will deploy at thirty three minutes after launch. Now, this is the part that is one of those single points of failure. Well, actually, the launch, <laughs> the fairing separation, the upper stage separation, and the solar array deployment, these are all single points of failure for the launch. Uh, there's four of them right here today. Uh, if any one of these don't happen, the mission is, is in big, big trouble. Uh, but the solar array, once it is deployed, means that the telescope is getting power from the solar panels and not from the batteries on board, which is a big deal. So. Um, so I just, so that's what we're looking at today. Um, and I'm going to be streaming up until this point, the, the, in the subsequent weeks, uh, next week, I may not be streaming, but the week after that we'll pick up, we'll, we'll see where web is and go along on subsequent, um, on subsequent, um, uh, uh, milestones of the deployment to see how it's doing. Um, I'm going to keep this, uh, up right now just in case for the next right now they're just interviewing people that's thomas Zerbuchen. <laughs> he's the head of the nasa science directorate the guy who's ultimately in charge of all of this as i've mentioned many times in my streams nasa is divided into two big parts there's the human spaceflight part and then there's the national or the uh, science directorate part that's 
this is the part the web falls under all the way from uh uh uh, doing the Mars rovers to Hubble Space Telescope, New Horizons to Pluto, all the all of those uh, efforts are led under the under his direction, Thomas Serbukin. So, um, so uh, that is uh, he's in charge right now, telling us all about what what to expect. Now, I I'm only gonna I'm gonna have this up, but because I want to share this with you, you guys, I'm, I know you guys have the NASA stream on your own browser so so um, I'll, i will make the sound come on when we when i start to see something decent but right now i want uh, i want to uh just kind of share this with you guys by doing this reading the chat hi galaxia welcome merry christmas i hope you're having a good christmas so far mine's just started um let's see uh austin i'm presumably you're from you're down under so it was a nice day oh perth yes 43 oh my god <laughs> you guys are used to warm christmases though aren't you i tell you i wonder how are the um i, I haven't heard much about wildfires uh lately so i hope i hope things are okay on that front you guys had a hard time of it there a couple of years ago so welcome i'm glad you're here thanks for joining us from down under uh it's good to see you as always um yeah, Dorian's commenting. This is uh, like a modern day egg hatching. The way this thing is is going to unfold, so it's pretty amazing. Okay, I'm going to try and turn this down just a bit because I want to be able to hear things, but it also distracts me having things going on in my head. So, um, oh no. Peter's, you had, you, uh, are you talking about, uh, COVID? Well, I know you're vaccinated, so, uh, hopefully it won't be too bad for you. Um, yeah. Now, hi, good morning, Pyro. It's good to see you. Uh, 302 is morning to you. Yes. Yes. It is, uh, 708 AM local time here in, in central Florida. So yeah, it's very, uh, it's very early here. Yeah, so yeah, it's definitely afternoon for you guys. All right, so um, let's see. Hey, Tony, been following you since 2008. No way. Oh, my God. You are, you're an oldie but a goodie like I am. Can't believe we finally got to this day. Uh, I'm talking pre-SFN days. That's right. Pre yeah, pre-Space Fan News. Yeah. Um, my channel has been through so many iterations of what I'm doing with it, uh, in large part because of the ebbs and flows of YouTube. Uh, but the uh, <laughs> uh, welcome, I'm glad you stayed with me all this time. God knows where this channel is going. Um, the the things that I'm able to do on this channel have changed so much because of YouTube's pro pro call it practices that all I'm really doing primarily right now is live streaming. So uh, I don't even do space fan news that much anymore just because of uh, the problems with YouTube. So um, racer girl saying it's seven, it's four Oh seven where you are. So, well, gosh, so are you, let's see, are you in the, uh, are you on the West coast? That's like the Pacific time zone. So, um, like she said, where is that web center we saw in, in Guyana or in Houston? Uh, it's in Guyana. Friend, all of that is in, uh, it's all being, ESA is handling the launch. Uh, that is part of their partnership with the Web Space Telescope Mission. And they are, uh, they're handling all of it. So all wish it control, all of it's handled down in uh, French Guyana uh, in Kourou. So that's where the, the launch is happening. Houston has nothing to do with this, um, this particular launch. Peter Stokes is commenting. Uh, so they think they will launch this on Christmas morning without any consideration and have no, con I don't think so. Repent. <laughs> okay. Thank you, man. Thank you, Peter, for sharing. I appreciate that. Um, <laughs> and, I, and, and I like this one too. So <laughs> YouTube. I love it, man. JWST greater than man on Mars. You know something, Tursen? I'm going to agree with you on that. I'm going to agree with you on that. I'm more excited about this than I am about sending human beings to Mars. Why? Because of the um, uh, 
the level of discovery that we're going to get from this thing. Uh, this is the most complicated space telescope that's ever been launched. It's the most complicated thing that's ever been launched, uh, period. Regardless, any, any category of space vehicle, we've never done anything this complicated. And I would argue including going to the moon. But um, I was talking on Thursday about uh, have we done anything harder? Has humanity done anything harder than this? And I haven't heard a good answer as to anything that was harder that we've actually accomplished. Uh, we haven't accomplished this yet. I know I'm speaking a little too soon, so let me knock on wood. And uh, uh, I mean, let me put this expect uh, all systems to remain green. We'll be going down to the fishbowl to confirm that just a moment or two from now. Uh, it's a 27-minute uh, ride to orbit from uh, liftoff until the time that the uh, Webb Observatory is separated from the upper stage of the Ariane 5 rocket. Several minutes later, the commands will be given to unfurl its solar array, followed by the confirmation from the telescope controllers in Baltimore that uh, we are power positive, meaning that electrical current is flowing through that solar array. With us today, inside the so-called fishbowl, seated with mission controllers on the floor of the control room, is Raphael Chevrier of Ariane Spas. Raphael, how's everything looking? What's being discussed down there? Hi, Rob. Well, so far, so good. We just received the last uh, weather forecast. It's all green for the AGO that is uh, forecast right now. What we check was altitude winds, wind in the vicinity of the launch pad and risk of lightning. So right now, uh, it's, a, it's a relief because the, the, the weather was a, a bit uh, tough in, in the last uh, couple of days. But right now, everybody is very focused on the next steps. The start of the synchronized sequence at seven minutes before liftoff. Last operations that Luz described earlier before Webb and the Ariane 5 are going to lift off and soar into the sky. Thanks, Raphael. We'll be back with you and Luce here shortly. Uh, we now have confirmation from Baltimore that James Webb is on internal power. Amidst all of this activity, we cannot forget that it is Christmas Day. 53 years ago, the astronauts of Apollo 8. Okay, let me get to this question. Uh, this is from Bullshit Vendor. I love YouTube. <laughs> How reflective is the Kapton layer facing the mirrors? Could it could it produce artifacts in the captured image from reflecting the background star field somehow? And um, <laughs> she's Charlotte supplying me with coffee. <laughs> Thank you. Um, uh, the Kapton layer facing the mirrors. Um, it, it, I don't. Are you talking? Uh, so I'm not understanding your question. There, you, you're not talking about the gold coatings on the mirrors, right? You're talking about a capped on layer that is over those mirrors. Um, as far as the uh, producing, um, as, for, as far as producing artifacts, um, that has already been tested. This is not going to be like Hubble, where they've not, I don't, where they've left some some critical optical elements untested. So. So um, uh, I clarify your question because I'll, I'll get back to it because I'm not sure what you mean about the Kapton layer. The, 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 the mirrors are coated with a gold, actual gold coating, not Kapton. So help me understand your question a little bit better. All right, we're going to get, we're getting like to like five or six minutes. So I'm going to put sound on. Uh, the first one coming up just a few seconds from now, which will be the uh, topping off of the main stage tanks. Uh, the... Uh, First or core stage was loaded earlier this morning with 175 tons of propellant, 150 tons of liquid uh, oxygen, and uh, 25 tons of liquid hydrogen. The upper stage loaded with 15 ah, tons okay, of propellant. Okay, thank you. Thank you for that helping will be me. The workhorse You're talking about the for sun a shield. Okay. Minute burn no, to lift no, there's James no way Webb that that's going to, to produce its final uh, orbit. Uh, 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 at separation, uh, reflection some 27 minutes of the way and seven it's going seconds to be after launch. Uh, James will Webb be will be at an altitude of about 864 miles. To put that into perspective, so some uh, uh, 520 the miles will be higher than the no Hubble Space Telescope side and more than 600 miles higher telescope. than the no International Space there. Station. Webb at that point will be traveling about 21,000 miles an hour it. as it heads out to a highly elliptical, halo-like racetrack orbit some 1 million miles from... So that we're not 
getting too distracted. Um, are there already observations scheduled for JWC or did they not make plans yet for fear of jinxing the launch? That's a good question. Uh, yes, the first full year has already been decided. They call it cycle one. I'm going to have a stream the first week of January where we're going to do nothing but look at the first year of observations that are planned for the James Webb Space Telescope. I'll be doing that the first week of January. We're going to go through a lot of the more interesting ones ourselves and I'll talk about those. But the full, the first full observing year of JWST has already been decided and planned out. So good question. The disconnection of the upper stage, this big cryotechnic arms you can see on this uh, on this picture. Then three seconds before the H0, the inertial platform that will give all the information about where it is to the launcher will be released. And at H0, the seven second sequence to ignite the Vulcan engine of the main start stage will start. That will take seven seconds, a little less than seven seconds, where the engine will start up to its flight regime. Once the computer has checked that the Vulcan engine is running normally, and you will see at that point a flame going stable at the outlet of the nozzle. And at that point, the onboard computer will ignite the two boosters that will enable to move the 770 tons of Ariane and Webb. Coming up on the T-minus four minute mark right now, uh, just a couple of milestones real quick. At the one minute, five second mark into the flight, uh, Ariane 5 will go through the period of maximum dynamic pressure, Ma max Q as it's known. Uh, that uh, will be uh, the period of maximum aerodynamic forces on uh, the rocket itself. The uh, solid uh, rocket boosters, which will provide about 90% of the initial thrust off the launch pad, will uh, shut down and separate at the two minute, 21 second mark into the flight, followed a minute and five seconds after that by fairing jettison. That will expose the James Webb Space Telescope to uh, the environment of flight for the first time. The main stage separation or the first stage separation comes at the T minus at the uh, eight minute, 47 second mark into the flight. And that will be about a 16 minute burn of that upper stage engine. It will cut off uh, at about 24 minutes, 51 seconds into the flight. And then we'll go into a coast phase of about two and a half minutes to allow any oscillations to dampen out, provide the most pristine environment for the James Webb telescope before observatory separation. We're coming up on the uh, two minute, 50 second mark into the flight. Again, you're going to be hearing critical calls down the stretch here from the DDO or the range operations manager, Jean-Luc Voyer. Wow, this is this is like <laughs> this is tense. I guess the weather say. is go. <laughs> we have a green board. No issues being worked. NASA officials, including Greg Robinson on the right, uh, carefully uh, watching uh, the telemetry, looking intently at the final couple of minutes of the countdown. Lives have been spent in the preparation of the James Webb Space Telescope that is about to fly. And Beatrice Romero on his, uh, on his side on the left of the screen from Ion Space. Okay, okay. And okay. that is the uh, DDO, the Range Operations Manager, Jean-Luc Voyer, as Not we have much. hit the two-minute mark in the countdown. Minute 48. The flight will be in two phases. You will see the first part of the flight during the solid rocket boosters phase. That will be the atmospheric part of the flight. The I'm glad flight. to hear that, man. That's cool. And the trajectory will be driven by a very, to, you to know, reduce the This space telescope is for his generation. And right? We will this have a very different exo-atmospheric flight after that. And, and you were watching uh, a number of people, uh, VIPs and invited guests, moving out to the observation platform that is right next uh, to the Jupiter Control Center as we stand by for the one-minute call from Jean-Luc Voyer. There we go, a minute away. Thumbs up from Jean-Luc Voyer. All systems are go. We're inside a minute now, T minus 50 seconds and counting. As you heard earlier, uh, the Vulcan 2 engine will ignite 
Turbo pumps will come up to flight speed for Very seven true. seconds, and the command will be issued to ignite the solid rocket boosters. The James Webb Te Space Telescope will be on its way. T-minus 30 seconds and counting. Standing by for terminal count. Okay. At two the DDO, attention for the count final. This, nine, eight, seven, six, five, four, three, two, unity, stop. Oh my God! There we go. And we have engine start. And liftoff. There it is. There it goes. Decollage, liftoff from a tropical rainforest to the edge of time itself. James Webb begins a voyage back to the birth of the universe. Oh, that's gorgeous. That's beautiful. Punching a hole through the clouds, 20 seconds into the flight. Good pitch program reported. There it is. Oh, my God. Oh, Godspeed, JWST. Vehicle performance is nominal. This is one of the most important launches in human history, right? Here. The Ariane 5 rocket continues uh, to fly uphill in nominal fashion. The rumble of the powerful Ariane 5 now being felt here in the control center. 3D animation. We can hear the noise and feel the vibrations here. You're right, Rob. Yeah, impressive. 13 kilometers in altitude, seven kilometers downrange, traveling uh, about uh, 0.6 kilometers per second. Yeah, the clouds. The well, trajectory it is reported area. to be nominal by Jean-Luc Voyer, the uh, range operations manager. Hey, JBD, you can see at see, the bottom the of your screen, the yellow line is the trajectory plot perfectly overlaid over the green line, which was the pre-launch trajectory. One minute, 41 seconds into the flight, about 40 seconds away from shutdown of the solid rocket boosters. I couldn't have said it better myself, Galaxia. I couldn't have said it better. Uh, Coming up on the two-minute mark into the flight. Yeah. When it detects the threshold on acceleration, the dis not the deceleration, but uh, less acceleration. For the... Oh, oh, everything is okay. Everything Drew, I'll, is I'll talk about this in just a bit. Two minutes, 15 seconds into the flight. When the computer detects this threshold, it will separate. Separation des EAP. Done. We have confirmation of solid rocket booster separation from Jean Luc Voyer. This coming at an altitude of 44 miles. The Ariane 5 and James Webb traveling almost 5,000 miles an hour. We have about one minute, five seconds to go before fairing jettison. That'll be the next critical milestone. Yeah. The fairing is there to avoid the yeah, my, being exposed uh, So to I'm capturing NASA's stuff. And also high um, air pros. And then restreaming and as as it. So I'm going to be behind. Leaves the atmosphere, as is now the case. The satellite does not need anymore to be protected, and <laughs> the web does not need anymore to be protected. So each kilogram being very important for the performance of the launch, we are going to eject this no more useful fairing. What's the difference between distance and altitude? Look and at let's that go graph. Down to the floor uh, in and the Jupiter Control why. Center to Raphael Chevrier. It's not going straight up. Spas. That's why Raphael, the so and far so good. Hi, Rob. So far, so good. Everything is nominal, as uh, we say, when attitude and trajectory of the Ariane 5 is going perfectly well. As you can see also on the yellow line, de la on the screen, we had the confirmation of the uh, separation of the two sweet boosters and now of the fairing, meaning that we have crossed the limits of the atmosphere. So everything is going super good. And the DDO just said that all parameters are going perfectly, perfectly smoothly. So oh, I like that shot. And Raphael, uh, this is a view uh, from the upper stage camera called the Vicky Cam, looking back at the James Webb Space Telescope. Oh, this is this. on about this a 20 great. second delay or so because of the way the imagery is processed uh, here in the control room. There's your telescope. 
ready to unfurl uh, its uh, wings, basically, and begin uh, its uh, journey to a, the Lagrange point, the L2 point, about a million miles away from Earth. Wow. The trajectory is nominal. Trajectory is nominal. The report from Jean-Luc Voyer. Did they already, the fairings already separated? I didn't see that part. Okay. The liftoff time confirmed here in the Mission Control Center at 12.20 Greenwich Mean Time, 9.20 a.m. Peru time, 7.20 a.m. Eastern time. <laughs> we were all worried, Lundbox, all of us were, man. The Ariane 5 and James Webb, 181 uh, kilometers in altitude, 450 kilometers downrange from the launch site here in Kourou. Flight control is very smooth. Five minutes, 12 seconds into the flight. We have about uh, three and a half minutes to go in uh, main stage or first stage uh, it'll, performance. It'll take 29 days to and get again, to And again, you can see point. at the bottom of your screen, the uh, yellow uh, plot line overlaid over the green line, meaning we'll have uh, we are right on course, this. right down the pike and a perfect trajectory so far for the Ariane 5 rocket. Telemetry data are now received by the Galio tracking station, which is, which is close to here, where we are in Kourou. It will track the launcher up to the ignition of its upper stage, and then we'll, we'll have the natal station in Brazil, Ascension, in the, as you can see on the map, in the middle of the ocean, and the two last stations in Africa. Libreville and Malindi, one on the east coast, the other one on the west coast. And the one on the west coast, Malindi, you can see that the satellite will be, the telescope will be separated more, over, more or less over this Malindi station. And this Malindi station will also acquire the telemetry data from the telescope. You can see both are green, Galio and data on this animation. It means they are expected to receive the, da the data, and it was confirmed right now by the launch operations manager. That Acquisition of the measure by the station of Natal in Brazil. And just confirming now that telemetry is being processed uh, through the Brazilian tracking station. The telescope is also uh, processing telemetry through the tracking and data relay satellite system as it uh, moves further and further out into deep space. All of the telescope's uh, telemetry and its imagery ultimately will be processed through the deep space network in Goldstone, California. We passed the seven minute mark into the flight, a perfect ride to, so far on the Ariane 5. We have about uh, one and a half minutes to go in the first stage performance. Once uh, the main stage uh, engine is commanded to cut off, it will be uh, jettisoned. And just a few seconds after that, the upper stage engine will, will ignite and it uh, will be the workhorse for a 16 minute burn that will put uh, James Webb into its preliminary orbit. <laughs> I like that, George, good. <laughs> About 11 minutes from now, uh, telescope controllers at uh, the Space Telescope Science Institute will be sending commands to prepare James Webb for the initial uh, series of commissioning activities uh, that will lead to, to the deployment of its solar array and uh, the initiation of generation of electrical power for the telescope. About 30 seconds away from main engine cutoff, The trajectory is normal. Nominal trajectory continues uh, to be the watchword for the day from the range operations manager, Jean-Luc Voyer, as we stand by for main engine shutdown and separation. Extinction of l'EPC. And we have main stage shutdown and separation confirmed here in the Mission Control Center and the ignition of that upper Allumage stage. PSC. And Raphael Chevrier down uh, in the fishbowl. Uh, so far, so good. 
Yes, Rob, we have the confirmation of the separation of the main stage and the ignition the of the upper stage. The trajectory is perfectly nominal. This is a very important moment for us because it's always a, re uh, a challenge to switch on a cryogenic engine in space condition. And we are now at 220 kilometers of altitude. Speed is a bit more than seven kilometers per second. As we enter now the second stage of uh, the second uh, phase uh, of uh, the flight, the upper stage is going to power for about, calme. for about 16 minutes to place Webb on its transfer orbit. And right now, everything is again nominal, as the DDO just said. Wow, this is really going smoothly. This is and a short time from now, uh, the uh, so called sawtooth maneuver. Uh, will get underway the, again, uh, like rocking a baby in a cradle. This will be a maneuver to keep Webb's optics protected from overheating loose. Exactly, Rob, like a baby in a cradle. Uh, you can see here Webb attached on top of Ariane 5 upper stage with a very specific configuration. Of course, it will be different uh, during its lifetime, but for the time being, it's uh, it's it's sun shield is folded and not yet Tout fully protected in the observatory. A number of uh, studies have been performed by the mission teams in, in Europe, in the US, on the temp thermal conditioning inside the telescope and the way the rays of the sun would propagate and interact with sensitive equipment inside the telescope. The maintain this thermal conditioning is really key before separating this, uh, this telescope. And in particular, we know that one face of the telescope cannot face the sun. That's why the, and to produce these right thermal conditions inside the web, a specific roll low has been designed, what we call the SOTUS approach. And if you are, if you are watching carefully to these images, La you can see this animation, nominal. you can see that the upper stage is going 30 degrees on one side, then 30 degrees on the other side, going back and forth this way to to maintain this uh, perfect thermal conditioning for the for the telescope. It's uh, worthwhile noting that uh, after Webb separates from the upper stage uh, of the Ariane 5 rocket, which continues to perform in excellent fashion at coming up on the 12 minute mark into the flight, uh, the telescope controllers uh, will be taking the baton, if you will, from the mission controllers here in Kourou. Uh, the first steps will be the opening of fuel valves, a pair of fuel valves everybody, to start everybody flowing in fuel to like, onboard oh. thrusters. Uh, <laughs> they they then will part. power on the valve drive <laughs> electronics. Uh, those are powered on in preparation to control and fire those thrusters when required. Webb's solar array is scheduled to be deployed at approximately the 33 minute <laughs> mark into the flight. Once it is locked in place, we'll get the call uh, that uh, electricity is flowing through the array. That call uh, will come from the mission operations manager, Carl Starr, who is at the uh, Space Telescope Science Institute at Johns Hopkins in Baltimore. Uh, seated right behind him in that control room is Alicia Starr, uh, a pair of stars. Uh, yeah, Pyro, to your question uh, James Webb uh, earlier, on its discovery uh, almost of the immediately stars, after it leaves Alicia the launch pad, it is not the, uh, going lead, straight uh, up. It's already going at an and angle. Ascent uh, there's never a point where uh, it's going straight up. Uh, then a uh, three out of the four hold downs for the aft deployed radiator will be released to prevent binding due to the cool down of the telescope's composite structure. Cheers, the Kenneth. contamination control heaters will be enabled to protect instrument optics on web from any water ice condensation as they cool down. The actuator drive unit will be powered on. This particular mechanism helps with heater La control preventing water ice con uh, condensation later to be used uh, to position each of the mirror's segments. All six reaction wheels and the wheel drive electronics will be powered on for Webb, and that will be the precursor to the attitude control system using those reaction wheels to maintain the proper orientation with the sun, as opposed to using onboard thrusters. Uh, of course, fuel uh, in those thrusters, very valuable. It's a, a limited commodity for the lifetime of James Webb's uh, observations of the universe. We're 13 minutes, 55 seconds into the flight. Jean-Luc uh, 
Boyer, the uh, range operations manager, continues to report a nominal performance. TT, this is going a million Webb. and a half miles or kilometers away. Past and again, uh, loose Fabriguet from the European Space Agency. Uh, how is this uh, trajectory uh, being uh, carefully and methodically adjusted uh, to provide the uh, correct parameters uh, in the final stages of ascent? Yes, Rob, as you can see on this plot, the, the altitude is slightly going down. It's perfectly normal. The launch vehicle is uh, really on the, on the line where it should be. This decrease of its altitude, slight decrease of its altitude, will allow the launcher to benefit and the upper stage to benefit of the gravity effect and to increase its velocity until it reaches a thermal threshold. It's about to reach it or even already reached, reached it now, and it will go up. Yeah, now it will go up and that's a up, good point, Dennis. Uh, this is going to be of the, the limiting web factor telescope. of this mission is going to be fuel. It will separate the web go, telescope go arrive, on a highly right, elliptic so orbit, will, but, but yeah, still around the Earth, the satellite, the telescope so, yeah, will be released, inserted on a orbit around the Earth with an apogee, a very high apogee, above uh, what we <laughs> Just some regular coffee, man. Um, Trajectory uh, nominal is reported some, uh, by Jean-Luc Boyer. You see him around, in that so that's view, what I'm 185 <laughs> kilometers in altitude, uh, some 4,500 yeah, uh, kilometers uh, downrange from the launch site here in Karoo, moving at uh, more than uh, eight kilometers per second, uh, right on the plot, right on the trajectory, everything looking great. We are, are about, uh, nine minutes away from the completion of upper stage ignition, it's shut down, and then about a two and a half minute Depuis coast day, phase before Webb will separate, observatory separation will be called out. You'll be hearing uh, those calls and the initial calls uh, from Carl Starr, the mission operations manager at the Space Telescope Science Institute at Johns Hopkins through solar array deploy and the declaration of a power positive spacecraft. Uh, you know, James Webb, of course, will be traveling well beyond the moon uh, to a distance of about a million miles away from Earth, there you go, settling TT. into a highly elliptical, halo-like orbit to so begin no. its astronomical observations. And again, as we mentioned earlier, at the time of observatory separation, Webb will be at an altitude of approximately 864 Nippon, miles, Nippon, everything's going miles great, man. traveling it's some 21,000 miles smooth, say uh, an hour. Yeah, there's a, there's a lot about orbital motions that about are eight minutes counterintuitive away. Sure. Sure. from upper Scott stage uh, shutdown. He, he'll definitely, he definitely the, knows about uh, that The stage has stuff. performed uh, as planned. No issues reported. Uh, the launch occurring at 12.20 Greenwich Mean Time, 9.20 Karoo Time, 7.20 a.m. Eastern Time on this Christmas Day. <laughs> Very smooth. Yeah, I look pretty chill. The I don't feel that chill inside. But very important, the velocity you just chill. mentioned. I'm, I'm very of the pleased telescope right now without it's very it's important. Going. It will be slightly below. Okay, give it in a kilometer per second, but it will be slightly below ten yeah, kilometers per I mean, second because uh, it's important that this is a the good satellite, right here. the telescope, the real, is not the real, inserted the launch on an escape the real orbit. It will be placed on a terrestrial orbit, so that there will be time for the early phase operations on the and the commissioning of the telescope and that will be in fact the upper stage that will leave this orbit and goes toward an escape liberation orbit and of course even uh, though we're still in powered flight the uh, trajectory the acceleration the speed at which james webb is going towards its preliminary orbit all modeled in advanced uh in advance and uh, carefully choreographed to maintain as a quiescent an atmosphere and environment around the telescope uh, for its ultimate separation from the upper stage of the Ariane 5 rocket, which is about uh, six and a half minutes from now. Six and a half minutes. That's going to be a big milestone, that. 18 and a half minutes into the flight. It's very quiet now here in the uh, control center here in Karoo. NASA officials, European Space Agency officials, Ariane Spas officials, all watching uh, telemetry very carefully.
<clears throat> do you mean the next one after JWST? That would be uh, the Nancy Grace Roman Space Telescope, uh, what used to be called W First. Uh, that'll be a wide and field as, uh, survey the upper stage uh, continues same, to burn uh, nominally and sheds fuel. So, and it'll be uh, the acceleration the uphill uh, for the James Webb yeah. Space Telescope continues to increase as we approach the 20 minute mark into the flight. Again, upper stage cutoff is scheduled at the 24 right. minute 51 second mark into the flight about five and a half minutes from now. After the cutoff of this main engine, as you said, uh, Rob, we will have a short ballistic phase, a short costing phase that will, uh, when when the upper stage will rely fully on its, at what we call the attitude and roll control system. And it will adjust its, its attitude so that during That's this well said, so uh, small uh, ballistic phase, uh, all the requirements from the telescope are fully met. And that at the separation, when, when there will be the separation, the conditions will be very smooth and as requested for the telescope. Today's it countdown really does, uh, was as flawless as uh, you yeah. can imagine. It gives me a uh, the lot weather uh, was the perfect was uh, all the way through the early morning yeah, hours, for sure. uh, so through the uh, fueling process of the vehicle. The weather's been a bit yeah. dicey here in Kourou over the past few days, but everything uh, fell Kourou, together French on this Guyana. Christmas Day uh, to send uh, a new there. present to the world's astronomer. 20 minutes, 40 seconds into the flight. Trajectory normal. All parameters nominal as reported by Tom audio is not Boyer, the range the, uh, operations manager. Up there. Four minutes of powered flight Don't remaining. Don't forget to breathe. That's right. Don't forget to breathe. Yeah, they're getting ready to hand it off soon to uh, the JWST Control Center in Baltimore. And uh, they will be controlling it after separation. That's right, Kenneth. Um, and we're going to be streaming a lot during the next 29 days to cover various parts of this. This is the part, all of it. This uh, these, these critically important deployments, as you call them. Uh, is the biggest risk to the mission the in my opinion. Western so coast of we're nowhere near out of the woods yet. Flight control is nominal. The trajectory is uh, fully normal, fully as expected as you can see on the on the plot with the red with the yellow plot uh, over the green one. That is the expected one. Twenty-two minutes into the flight. Less than three minutes of powered flight Pilotage remaining. Et calme. Smooth flight control. And again, as we've mentioned uh, before, everything uh, nominal reported by the range operations manager, as we've mentioned before, this is a long <laughs> ride uphill Kenya. for the James Webb Space Telescope to put it at the proper position in the sky uh, so that it can escape from the Earth, basically, head beyond the moon <laughs> towards its final orbit uh, for yeah, like uh, its commissioning activities too. that will be the dominant feature of uh, all of the operations from the Space Telescope Science Institute over the course of the next several weeks. And the launch operations manager announced the acquisition by uh, by, by, Lindy, by, the, by the Malindi station as expected for the last, for the end of the flight and the last uh, part of the upper stage flight and the separation of the telescope. James Webb is about four minutes away from separating from the upper stage. And again, at that point, uh, it will be on its own. And again, those milestones that we discussed a bit earlier in the broadcast uh, will begin uh, to uh, be followed carefully by the telescope controllers at the Mission Operations uh, Center, the MOC as it's called, at the Space Telescope Science Institute the in Baltimore. One minute of powered flight remaining. The 
upper stage uh, continues to function perfectly. It's been a uh, smooth ride for the James Webb Space Telescope. Trajectory nominal. Yeah, but you know what, warp drive. That's also true of of every telescope, right? any spacecraft that gets launched. Upper stage because uh, was the, loaded. The delay in technology uh, is always morning, behind the time of the launch. Fifteen tons of propellant. Hubble, too. Hubble for this was launched launch sixteen with 80s minute technology, burn, even though it was launched in the nineties. Now about thirty seconds away from but it was upper stage by cutoff, time, so it got upgrades. But your point is well taken. Um, but the technology that is on board JWST is designed to meet the science requirements that it's designed for, which is. Uh, which is fine. You don't need more than you need when you're trying to yeah, learn standing specific by things. For you upper design stage your telescope to learn those and, things. Uh, and they, they cut off of the uh, upper stage engine. So it's fine that it's not this most state-of-the-art everything. The question, real question is, can it do the science? It was meant to be done to get, get done. And the answer is yes. The parameters are normal. The extinction of the, the shutoff, of the, the cutoff of the engine was confirm exactly good, as good point expected. there isn't one sebastian we do exactly expected altitude and speed and velocity so now we are we have entered the coasting phase the ballistic phase that will last for a little more than two minutes hey deep sky hunter welcome And the telescope controllers uh, in Baltimore uh, confirming that uh, all of the uh, function uh, parameters for the James Webb Space Telescope have been loaded on board the telescope. Uh, we are expecting uh, web separation at the 27 minute, seven second mark here into the flight. Just over a minute from now, Springs will gently push Webb away from the upper stage of the Ariane 5. As it moves further and further away from uh, the upper stage, uh, there'll be what uh, we refer to as a collision avoidance maneuver. Yes, yes, Rob, exactly. The springs already will give some distancing, of course, between the two objects, between the telescope and the upper stage. And then the upper stage will leave the trajectory of the telescope and makes a special maneuver to pass the telescope and heads towards a liberation orbit and leaves the telescope on its, on its uh, orbit uh, without any risk of collision and without any risk of pollution towards the telescope. And we're about uh, 17 seconds away from web separation That's right, Pyro. I agree with that statement. Hey, Ebone. Welcome. Web nice to meet you. Telescope. Go web. There it goes. <laughs> All right, that was a big one. We do have confirmation of observatory separation. The James Webb Space Telescope, amidst applause here in the Mission Control Center, now taking its first steps in pursuit of cosmological discovery. It was a perfect ride to orbit. Not yet, we're not yet. Ratnick. And all of the uh, separation uh, sequence of that solar running in good fashion, according to the telescope controllers. And there is the view uh, from the upper stage camera on the Ariane 5 looking at the James Webb Space Telescope as it moves uh, gently away from its launch vehicle. Fantastic pictures of oh, this that's Go Webb, go Webb. Ah, yes, ah, I get the reference, Uriah. I get the reference. Ironically enough, as we marvel on uh, this view from the upper stage camera, this will be humanity's last view of the James Webb te Space Telescope as it moves to its work uh, place about a million miles away from Earth. Yes, you're right, Rob. Impressive, fantastic pictures, yeah. Now we'll be hearing uh, shortly from the Mission Operations Manager at the Space Telescope Science Institute, 
uh, Carl Starr, who will be uh, calling out uh, the procedures that will lead uh, to the deployment of Webb's solar array. And down uh, in the fishbowl uh, where there is jubilation, let's go to Raphael uh, Chevrier of Ariane Spas. And before we do that, uh, Raphael, uh, uh, a bit earlier than planned, but there is the solar array having been deployed. Yes. All James right. James Webb now uh, has its array out. That's it. As we stand by for a confirmation that it is power positive. Yeah, that's what we want. Hey, Rob. That's a good view. That's a that's excellent. And there it is. There's your critical call. Okay. James Webb not only has legs, but it has power. Oh, good. As it uh, begins right. uh, its journey and the commissioning activities to follow. All right. And with that, let's go down to the floor uh, in the fishbowl and uh, Raphael Chevrier of Ariane Spas. This is it. We have witnessed and the confirmation that Ariane 5 has safely delivered Webb into space. The upper stage is now being placed on a safe um, escape orbit around the sun. But Honestly, I've got to tell you that these images are absolutely incredible. And well, it may be the end of the mission for our in space, but it's only the beginning of the journey for okay. Webb. It's now on its way to the Lagrange point. Congratulations to all the team involved in the flight. Really, there is no words to describe the immersion that uh, is happening right now in the fishbowl. So uh, all I can say is good luck, Webb, and bring us incredible data from the deep universe. At that point, our statements will continue. Will well, Raphael, uh, congratulations on a uh, perfect ride to orbit uh, from the Ariane 5 out of Kourou here today. A view here in the uh, Space Telescope Science Institute. Their work just beginning on a new era of scientific observations. Uh, Luce Fabregat, uh, it was a smooth ride to orbit. Everything went uh, by the book, almost like a simulation, without any problems. And uh, we thank you for all of your insight throughout the course of the day. Thanks to Europe and really great <laughs> definitely, I have made definitely, faces Dennis. And names now coming up to my mind, and uh, really, you can be proud of what uh, what was achieved on both sides of the Atlantic Ocean. Thanks a lot to you. Tremendous uh, jubilation here in the uh, control center. You're looking at Jean-Luc uh, Voyer, the range operations manager. Quite a Christmas present for the world's astronomers as the James Webb Space Telescope begins its life heading towards deep space. With that, uh, we're going to go back to the floor now uh, to uh, Katie Haswell. All right. Katie. All right. I think that's... Uh... <laughs> All right, that's that's the big stuff right there, folks. Um, so let's. Uh, whew, that was a big deal. That was a big deal. Uh, the the uh, James Webb Space Telescope has been a long time coming. A lot of frustrations, a lot of money, a lot of uh, a lot of hard feelings. But now it's 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 starting to pay off, and um, the the May the, so the launch has happened. I I don't think that's about the smoothest launch I've ever seen. And let's hope that's a harbinger of what's to come uh, in the coming days. Uh, which means, what do we? So what do we have coming up? So we have, um, we we have what's so we just got the deployment of the solar array. That was uh, that was the big that was the big one I was worried about, and uh, that means and Web is getting power. Uh, on to its onboard systems independently of everything else. Um, so the next big step will be uh, in about 12 and a half hours, according to this explorer, they're going to be doing a mid-course correction burn. And um, uh, so it's on a direct path right now to the L2 point, but it needs to make some course corrections. Um, and, and well, I found this interesting, so I'm going to read this to you. Uh, the reason they need to do a course correction maneuver is by design, because if Webb gets too much thrust from the Ariane 5 rocket, 
uh, it can't turn around and thrust back towards Earth because that would directly expose its telescope optics and structure to the sun, overheating them and, abor and aborting the science mission before it can even begin. Therefore, Webb gets an intentional slight underburn from the Ariane rocket. What we've just seen, everything leading up to this point, has been an underburn. It won't get it there yet with, with, the, with the trajectory and the thrust that it's currently been subjected to. So therefore, a web gets an intentional slight uh, underburn from its uses, and it, there'll be another course correction designed to get it there. So think about that for a minute. That's, that's pretty cool. It can't, you need to get it right there. As so many things on web, the web mission is, is designed to do. There's no tolerance for much of an error there. You can't just launch it, do course corrections and go, oh, we went too fast, turn it around, slow down a little bit, turn it back around and go into, onto its course. You can't do that with web. You have to get it right directly. It has to be inserted in the L2 point without turning it around because the orientation of the web space telescope one of the reasons it's launching at 7 20 in the morning is to keep the orientation of the sun the earth and the moon and all of this stuff in, in the right orientation so that it's not facing the sun in any way this telescope has got to be kept cold uh, even now even though it hasn't even started deploying the sun shield yet so that's coming up in 12 and a half hours to get it tail to it's not going to get there as it is right now so we want to keep an eye on that. Uh, I'm sure ESA and uh, actually what you want to start monitoring now is S uh, Space Telescope Science Institute's Twitter feed as well as the Webb Space Telescope Twitter feed. Follow them on NASA. It's called NASA Webb Telescope. Um, and just follow them and, and get the tweets. That's what I'm going to be doing. Uh, throughout the day because it's also it's Christmas Day and we'll be and I'll be like <laughs> it's kind of like I'm the guy with with football you know watching a football game but he has to be with family you know I'll be doing this all day I'm on on Twitter and and mostly Twitter to to keep track of of anything strange going on so um so I think so I think that that's um uh so that's what's coming next and then following uh, that we got a bunch of smaller things after about a day there's a there's a gimp the antenna down here at the bottom is going to uh, deploy um, in, a, in a after about 24 hours uh, there's a here's a little launch video that oh maybe it'll show it maybe it won't here it goes um, this will deploy in about a day um, so we'll be able to see that uh, it's a communications antenna um, and um, from there, we've got the momentum, uh, I'm sorry, another course correction burn at two days. Uh, and then at three days, uh, this pallet lowers. That's a huge one. That one's going to be big. So let's see. What are we looking at today? Saturday, sun so Sunday, Monday to around Tuesday's time frame. This has to happen. Uh, this will be the thing that, um, uh, let me just show the video on that. Um this will be the precursor to the sun shield deploying. Deploying. Here we go. Uh, understandably, NASA's website is slow. Uh, so this is huge. This this uh, assembly here coming down. You can see the the heat shield rolled up in that. Or I'm sorry, sun shield rolled up in that. Uh, and that's got to deploy. Um, and then after that, we are looking at the aft pallet coming up about three days. It also at the same time, that's the same thing, but the back one. Um, and in four days, uh, uh, this tower assembly, this whole thing, I don't know if you can see where my, my cursor is pointing, but this, this whole thing here actually goes up. Let me see if I can show that video. This, I'm looking at the Deployment Explorer on jwst.nasa.gov, so you can do all of this yourself to find out what's coming up next. Um, oh, that's too slow. All right. Okay, so that one's taking too long, but they, but uh, that's this whole thing coming up here. So that's what we have to look forward to uh, on that as well. Um, oh, <laughs> I suppose I should be watching, but I want to I want to just kind of share a few things with you. I, I have to watch the uh, VOD of that, so it's pretty cool, TV. I didn't know that. Um, 
So, JBD, yeah, keep keep it posted. I don't think I'm going to be able to do much next week, but in the following weeks, I'll be definitely doing a lot more streaming on this. So we'll see. Um, so we'll see how that goes. But um, but yeah, this is uh, stop and think for a minute just how many people have not only just worked on this as a job, but have given their careers to this moment where, and I'm sure Becky, Dr. Becky is one of those people that is, uh, you know, affected by this in, in, in many ways, but, but we've been at this since the, since before Hubble launched with the, with the, with the launch of this telescope. And there has been a lot of obstacles on the way. Um, this is probably the singular largest scientific instrument or achievement that NASA and the astro astronomical community has ever has ever really done and and I would even put that over the Apollo program or at least I would put it on par with the Apollo program uh, as far as achievements go and I, I I'm a lot when I ask the question have we done anything harder uh, the only thing that can compare I think is the Hubble pro or the Apollo program um, and that involved hundreds of thousands of people, billions of dollars as well to get us to the moon. The uh, motivations might have been a little different than what they are here. But this one, what makes this so amazing is that this is the mission that is being launched. And so much, so many lives, so many careers, so much money has been spent for no other reason than to learn more about our place in the universe. This isn't about politics. This isn't about planting flags. This isn't about, um, uh, you know, getting there first. It's just only and solely about discovering more about how we fit in to the cosmos. And I can't, I can't think of a more meaningful way, uh, meaningful thing to be able to do. I mean, the, when you think about the Apollo program, you think about some of the past things we've accomplished, there's such a high politically charged component to it that you end up, it kind of ends up taking away some of the, some of the um, greatness of it. And um, here, the James Webb Space Telescope, it is an international effort, um, primarily driven by NASA, but for, but the goals and the reasons for doing it were for none other than to just explore and find out where we fit in and so that's why it means so much to me my it's not an understatement to say that the uh hubble space telescope first deep field changed my life because the images from Hubble, that image in particular was not all that great it was not that beautiful of an image but what it represented was life-changing literally for me um, we stared at a blank spot in the sky where astronomers really, really did not think there was anything to see. And they pointed the most expensive, the most oversubscribed um, uh, telescope we've ever built at that spot in the sky for 11 days. And when they processed the images, they came out with an image that was filled with galaxies. And they've since done that many, many times. They did the ultra deep field uh, in uh, twenty uh, or in two in two thousand seven. They did it again they, with the extreme deep field in two thousand nine. And then the frontier fields did it six more times in different areas of the sky in two thousand thirteen or fourteen. We have so many deep fields now, and all of them show us the same thing: a galaxy or a, an image filled with galaxies. Every single dot, smudge, and smear in those images are galaxies. And that's true wherever we look. And now we're going to look past that. We're going to go even further beyond the ultra-deep fields that are taken by Hubble and see the very first stars and galaxies that have ever shown. The James Webb Space Telescope is going to be able, it's, it's got the, the, the primary mirror of, of such a size and a and the, and the, and the uh, wavelength capabilities that is going to let us see 
the very first galaxies, the very first stars that made up those very first galaxies that have ever shown in the universe. Not only that, when we point it inside the galaxy itself, the Milky Way galaxy, we're going to be able to image directly and measure directly exoplanets around other stars. We will be able to see if these exoplanets have atmospheres. And if they do have an atmosphere, what's in it? And we'll be able to resolve the disk of an exoplanet itself to see directly how, how big it is by blocking out the light from that star that it's in orbit around and see it directly. So the knowledge that we're going to gain about not just the very early universe, how the first stars came to be and how they coalesced into those first galaxies. But we're, we're, we're going to also learn more about the planets in our neighborhood, the planets in our galaxy. And perhaps we might learn that some of those atmospheres will have signs or signatures that indicate life, that life is possible on these. Right now, it's all speculation. All we can measure right now well, up until now, uh, has been the size of a planet, its its distance from its from its star, and we've been able to learn uh, how uh, how what its year is, how fast it goes around its star, and its mass, how massive it is. Those are the only things we've been able to directly measure about exoplanets. Kepler measured transits. Uh, many observatories on the ground are measuring the masses of exoplanets by seeing the radial velocity wobble. And so those are the only things we know right now. JWST is going to be able to tell us, do these planets have atmospheres? And do if they do have an atmosphere, what's in it? That's an amazing capability right there. And that will help us to better understand whether or not some of these planets are more conducive to life than others. It might even find undisputable um, evidence of life growing. What would that look like? Primarily in certain kinds of methane that's in the uh, that's in the atmospheres of those planets. Um, apparently, the, and I don't know no more than what I'm about to tell you, but there's there's just seeing methane in an atmosphere isn't enough. There's a specific kind of methane that, if it exists, can only be produced by plant and animal material. And if we find that somewhere, then we know there's life somewhere else. So. Something like this needed to happen. It needed to be launched. Uh, otherwise, we don't, we don't get any further in our knowledge of the universe. And this is the next step, the logical next step for going forward. After, uh, for the next five to 10 years, we're going to be amazed at what's going on with, with, uh, with, with what JWST will tell us. And the great news is we finally managed to get this thing up at, in, in time so that it can operate in conjunction and in parallel with the most venerable space telescope ever to be, get into orbit, Hubble. Hubble, amazingly, 31 years after launch and five repair missions later, is still giving us data. It's still working. It's still looking at things. It's still imaging stuff. And it has wavelengths that the James Webb Space Telescope does not have. It has ultraviolet capabilities. It has optical capabilities. It also has infrared, but we don't care about that so much anymore because JWST will see every will see the universe all the way from a half micron or 0.6 microns out to 28 microns. That's its entire wavelength range in the infrared. And I'll talk a lot more about that in coming streams. We've got the near infrared camera. We've got the mid infrared. Uh, 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 spectrometer. We've got near infrared uh, spectrometer, mid and near, and uh, uh, imaging capabilities. So there's a lot to look forward to with this telescope. And um, I want to thank you all so much for sharing it with with me. Um, this is, you know, this is a humbling experience to say the least. And I'm glad that I was able to share it with you guys. Um, and on a Christmas day, no less. So uh, that is, uh, so thank you very much. Let me get to a couple of comments and then I'm going to have to go. Um, oops, I clicked, you guys are chatting pretty good. <laughs> um, and so let's see here. Uh, I keep clicking on it, but it keeps moving. There we go. Uh, is there a minimum level of those types of gases in an atmosphere web can detect? Um, well, 
I think it will depend a lot on the specifics, but let's say that you've got a really, I, I imagine the limit would be something like the following. You've got a very bright star with a planet very close to its star and the micro shutters on near cam and near spec aren't able to block out the sun, the light enough to be able to get a decent spectrogram or spectrograph of that, of that, uh, atmosphere that might be a minimum level um as far it would just depend i think a lot on the specifics of the planet the how the size of the planet the uh the thickness of the atmosphere um and how the way in which the web is going to measure those things is it's going to as the planet transits in front of the star light will go from the star through the atmosphere of the planet onto web's detectors so that line of sight that goes through there will give Webb the spectra. So depending on that orientation, if it's direct head on, I'm sure it'll be able to see a very faint signal. But if it's kind of oblique where when it's observing it and it doesn't get a very uh, uh, good geometry uh, from for the making the observation, then that threshold may go way up uh, as far as what it can detect. So I don't know. Um, uh, it depends a lot on the specifics of what you're measuring. So as far as a minimum level of those types of gases, but the existence of those gases is all we need to know. Um, especially when I talk about this certain kind of methane that, that is, that is that's present that can only exist if there's life. If you see that at all, at any strength level, then you can be sure that life is there. But there and there's other biosignatures. And again, I'm not an expert on this at all. But there's other biosignatures that one can look for that can only be produced by life. Now, there's a great many things. Well, let me just back up. First of all, having an atmosphere at all is a big deal, <laughs> right? So regardless of what it's made of, even if it's like Venus, right? It's that's amazing to know that there's an atmosphere on these planets. Almost certainly, we're going to find a lot of planets that have those atmospheres of some kind. That's step zero. Getting getting that knowledge is huge because right now we say a lot of things about these exoplanets that we really are just don't have any idea about, right? That it might be a water world or it could be cloud covered in clouds because they are able to get, right now, astronomers are able to get rudimentary uh, spectrographs of the atmosphere, spectro, uh, spectro, yeah, spectrographs of the atmosphere um, to get some idea of what, of what is in there. Um, but... Web is going to really bring that home, right? So, um, so just to know that there's an atmosphere is is a pretty big deal in a, in and of itself. Um, uh, and Galaxia, I know you're very optimistic about this. And if we find an atmosphere like Earth, it's also undisputably life. That's right. Um, if we find anything that resembles Earth, and that Earth Earth's atmosphere would contain all kinds of biosignatures, um, then yeah, undisputably, uh, we found life. Um, uh, what will we not see from the James Webb Space Telescope? I, we won't see um, high energy jets from black holes or galaxies. Uh, because this is an infrared telescope, it won't look in the X rays or the shorter wavelengths. Um, so we won't be seeing anything in there. Um, and uh, what else won't it? So anything. What, what other phenomena will we not see? Um, uh, yeah, I would just say anything that, that involved, it won't, won't see gravitational waves because it's not a gravitational wave telescope, so we won't see those. I uh, won't see radio signals uh, because it's not there. So think about the the micro the the wave the the, the wavelength range of JWST, 0.6 microns to 28 microns. That's what it can see. And it's got that huge six and a half meter uh, diameter, so it's going to have a high resolving power. What is interesting to astronomers are the things that are that are in the infrared uh, are primarily the early universe. Um, the first stars and galaxies that shone in the universe were actually shining very brightly in the ultraviolet. And 13 billion years ago, these stars formed, lived only a million years and died in, you know, core collapse supernovae. We'll be able to see those. We'll be able to see the, the, uh, the infrared portion of those supernovae. Um, but we'll also be able to see, uh, but, but to get back to my point, that, the, that, that light, that those frequencies of, of radiation that those early stars and galaxies gave off have since been traveling over an expanding universe for 13 billion years, and that light has been redshifted into the infrared, right? So that's where they are right now. Here on Earth, 
from where we sit and 13 and a half billion years after they formed or 12 and a half billion years after they shone, we are looking at them in the infrared, even though they shone primarily in the ultraviolet and blue areas of the spectrum. So uh, we won't see anything outside of the infrared. So anything that you can think of in the sky that's ultraviolet, X-ray, um, high energy rays, uh, radio, none of that. Opt well, optical, I mean, people are bummed out that there's not a lot of optical capability here. But that's because starlight can travel through a lot of dust and gas in the universe and the Milky Way in the infrared. And we can see a lot more than we could at optical wavelengths. Optical wavelengths do present, we're, we're biased towards them. We like those pictures. But I predict you're going to be a fan of infrared imaging by the time James Webb has gotten started. So, um, so let's see. A couple more here. Um, finding an oxygen atmosphere is high, uh, relatively speaking. Level of methane is compelling. That's right. Um, so the um, so the next logical step. This is a good question, Builder. Is um, we this the next logical step after deployment and JWST gets going? Is it's going to start at cycle one observations? And let's we're going to dive into that in January. We're going to look at the um, the. We're going to physically go and look at the STSCI's website. Let's look at some of the observing programs they've got and talk about them uh, that it's going to be looking at first. Uh, first light, I think we're looking at about six weeks, I think they said. Um, uh, we're going to be looking at some of the first images uh, after, uh, after launch. So um, we'll obviously be keeping a, a big eye on that. So... <clears throat> um, Let's see. Did it deploy early? Was I not paying attention? I did not know that. Um, I don't. I didn't. I didn't see. I was so busy thinking about the stream that maybe I missed that. So I don't know. Did it deploy early? I'll have to look. Um, so let's see. Get a couple more questions. You guys are answering each other's questions, which is good. Um, this is a good point, bullshit vendor. Um, exomoons could potentially be more exciting, especially if you look at uh, our own solar system, Europa, Ganymede, or, or Europa, um, uh, um, Enceladus, and those kinds of moons around the, the the larger planets here certainly are interesting. I I don't know if Webb is going to be able to. Um, image any of these moons i think it depends a lot on the specifics but it would but radio velocity can already tell us if there are moons around these uh planets and maybe it can i don't know with the micro shutters um with the mic with the micro shutters that are there we might be able to have the ability to isolate the planet in such a way that we could see its moons but i don't know if it'll have that capability um let me see <clears throat> So let's see. Oh, Mav, I see we got we got somebody who's not a fan. <laughs> I'm overstating. What am I overstating? What am I overstating? Uh, <laughs> I don't think so. I'm certainly not overstating its importance. Um, if you if you care about knowledge and discovery, then uh, this is not an overstatement. This is not at all an overstatement. Um, Hey, Dan, it's good to see you from Canada. Uh, it is the center of the Milky Way too bright to examine, bright enough to harm the instruments? Um, good question. I don't think so. Um, I think what... It, um, no, I don't think it's too bright. Um, but this is just me giving you an opinion. Um, uh, I'm certain we're going to be looking at the center of the galaxy with this thing. Um, uh, there's a lot to see in the infrared uh, there, so I'm not sure. Um, yeah, that's right. Uh, so yeah, we will, we will learn a lot from this new telescope for sure. So let's see. <laughs> All right. Uh, there's one more question here. Um, as JWST is highly sensitive in the infrared, was it ever an option to decisively not point it away from the sun? as the detector itself points to the opposite rather than around the, rather 
point around a sun shield. Uh, it's highly sensitive. Anemia. Was it ever an option to decisively not point it away from the sun? Um, it can't get anywhere near pointing toward the sun. Um, so in order for this thing to stay cold and to stay as sensitive as it needs to be, it can't get anywhere near the sun. Remember, it's following the earth as it goes around the sun at the L2 point, and it's looking in the outer part of the solar system, away from the earth. The communication antenna is um, is on the, let's see if I can find a quick picture. Um, uh, let's see. Oh, here we go. Um, I'll, I'll show you this. So, um, so here, uh, this sun, the sun shield, this part here, um, the communications gear is on this side. But at no point will it ever uh, be pointing anywhere near the sun. So um, I, if I understand your question, was it ever an option to decisively not point it away from the sun? To not point it away. Uh, it's never been decided to point it anywhere but away. Um, and that was never going to be an option. So, and for reasons I, I just, just got through saying. So, um, so I don't know. I hope that answers your question. Uh, Sarah's commenting. Um, and that Louvoir would be able to get the atmospheres of the above mentioned exoplanets and also detect exoplanets in other galaxies. Uh, Louvoir might be able to, if it were launched and Louvoir is a, uh, JWST designed telescope looks just like JWST, only bigger, much, much bigger. And but as its name implies, it would be the uh, large UVOIR, which stands for ultraviolet optical and infrared observatory. So you're looking at a wavelength range that would be much greater than what Webb can do. That telescope would be uh, an amazing launch um, if we could uh, if we could get it. So. Um, it was something like it. A six and a half meter version of Louvoir was recommended by the Decadal Survey. It might get launched. Um, we'll have to see. Um, but uh, Louvoir would be basically the same size, the way it's been scoped now, is it'll be the same size as JWST, but with a much wider wavelength range. Because Hubble right now is the only game in town with um, uh, UV capability. Um, once Hubble goes down, there's no more ability to image in the ultraviolet. And that's important, especially with stars in our galaxy, um, to be able to see that wavelength range. So, um, Sarah's also asking, um, is it true that JWC will be, be able to detect most exoplanets of Earth size or bigger in our galaxy that can be observable from our position in the galaxy? Yes. Um, one of the reasons it, it, it will be able to resolve the disk of these planets, which means that we won't just see it as a tiny reflected point off of a star. We'll be able to see the disk itself. That's what six and a half meters gets you. So, um, yes, we will be able to detect those exoplanets. Whether we detect most of them or not, I don't know. The way it'll work is this way. We've already had Kepler uh, characterizing, uh, what is it, 3,000 exoplanets or something like that in the constellation Cygnus. It's found more as it when it operated at K2. Ground-based telescopes are finding a lot using the radio velocity method. Those candidates are going to be looked at by Webb and characterized if possible. So depending on what it is, what the system is, I can imagine they're look, it's going to be looking at Trappist, for example, the Trappist system, and it's going to be looking at Alpha Centauri and all of these other kinds of near, uh, nearer uh, exoplanet systems and try and characterize them. Um, so it will try and, but whether it does them all, I don't, I don't know that it's even capable of doing that, but the more interesting ones and certainly the ones that, that's, that are, have a high science value will definitely get looked at and anything showing any kind of evidence of life will get, get a lot of scrutiny by the James Webb Space Telescope. You can be sure. I think what I would like to see is a deep field from JWST. It'll be all in the infrared and I'd like to see them try and do that, um, at some point. Um, but it is true. Yes. Um, <clears throat> so, okay. I think guys, I've got a few more minutes here before I head out. Um, let's see. Will they be able to make an MRI 
of planets magnetospheres no no frederick it won't because um uh, oh and welcome from facebook wow i didn't think anybody on facebook was watching <laughs> um uh the magnetic field of anything is very hard to measure you can't actually the, the only way to actually measure a magnetic field is to be in it and um we haven't really even measured the magnetic field of the sun all that much, although the Parker Solar Probe is helping a lot. Stereo AMB has also helped quite a bit. But the only way to measure a magnetic field is to be in it. So um, to know there is a magnetic field around a planet, one has to look at other things that infer the existence of a magnetic field. For example, um, light. If you see an exoplanet atmosphere and the light that, is, that you're observing from that is polarized in any way, that polarization probably happened by accelerating charged particles in an magnetic field. So the solar wind, the stellar wind from a star interacts with the magnetic field of a planet if it's there. And in the same way that we have aurorae here on Earth, um, and those charged particles from that star, star will interact with the magnetic field of that planet and emit or, you, or, or and would radiate something called um, uh, synchrotron radiation. And that light is polarized. If that, if that polarized light is present, it's probably because of synchrotron radiation and it's probably uh, made by accelerating charged particles in a magnetic field. So that's how we tell if something has a magnetic field from a distance is we look at polarized light. And we recently did a, a hangout on uh, a, a new X-ray telescope that's going to look at charged, I'm sorry, polarized X-rays uh, uh, in, in, in part to get a sense of uh, uh, magnetic field strengths of various objects in the x-rays. So um, so the answer is no, they won't be making MRIs. And I don't think JWST has, well, if you look at polarized infrared light at an exoplanet atmosphere, then I think JWST will help us determine that, yes. Um, I'm trying to think if there's, so we have the mid infrared. Oh, so we have near cam, the near infrared camera. We have the near spec. We have mid infrared camera. And I don't know enough about polarized infrared light to know if that's an inference, if you can make that inference of magnetic fields from that. Um, I just don't know the answer to that part of it, if, what, what JWST will tell us. It's a good question, though. And you're right to want to know about magnetospheres. I think they're hugely important to the success of life on a planet. So I think one of the requirements, I would go so far as to say is a requirement for life on a planet is to have a magnetosphere. Um, it's very important. But I don't know if JWC is going to help us much with that. Um, so that's a good question, though. So Pyro wants to know, will there be reinterpretations of those infrared images in the optical spectrum? Uh, would part of the information be lost for those representative pictures. It depends on what it is. You take something in the infrared and then you take something in the, a picture of the same thing in optical, you don't see the same thing. Um, I used to have handy. I don't know if I still do. Let's see. Um, here we go. Yeah, I do still have this web page up. So I had, I had this up in a, in a live stream before. Um, let's look at the difference between, this is a comparison of JWST and Hubble. On the right, I'm sorry, on the left is a visible image of the Crena Nebula. On the right is that same thing in, uh, in infrared. So when you, re, when you say reinterpret, um, assumingly you mean here's a picture of the same thing in optical versus infrared. And what you can see clearly is that there are some there's some photons being given off by reflection uh, and emission in this nebula because this is a star forming region. But over here, you're able on the infrared side, you're able to see a lot of stars you wouldn't ordinarily get to see um, uh, because of gas and dust. 
for example, uh, there's a whole cluster. Well, you can just look at the difference. You can see all the places where there are stars in this image where there aren't over here. So it, this is, I guess, what you would call a reinterpretation. But you're actually not seeing everything in the optical here. You may, I mean, this is, we're biased, but this is maybe objectively prettier of an image. But scientifically, this is more important, the infrared side, because you can see the stars in there that are being formed in this nebula. Here in the optical, you can't because the optical wavelengths are being blocked by gas and dust, where here they are not. So by reinterpretation, I think that's what you mean. That is, a, this image on the left is a reinterpretation in optical of this of this image in infrared of the same exact thing will web do that no um we can't do this with web we can't do the right left side of this image with web we can only do the right side of this image so um that's all it can that's all it can show and while you may be disappointed that this image doesn't look as good as this one um I, I guess that's not the point. <laughs> the point is this one This one is going to have a lot more information for us to know things about. Um, so they're gonna, they're, we're going to see beautiful images from Webb, but they will not be the same images that we see from Hubble. So let's just get ready with that. Okay. So um, um, let's see. So that I guess that's, I, I'm, I'm looking for questions here. Um, Simon's commenting, I can't wait to see all the things we don't even know yet. That's right. Uh, here's one. Um, let's see from K Kukul. Um, uh, can, D can JWST continue the deep field of Hubble using its near IR instrument? Um, <clears throat> That's what I'm hoping it does. <laughs> yes, I, I I don't necessarily want to see a rehash of the Hubble deep fields. I don't want to see them going back to that point in the uh, in the Big Dipper where they where they imaged all those galaxies. Um, I would rather that they um, uh, do something different. Um, remember, the Hubble deep field was was in 2005. They did it again in 2007, and then uh, uh, 2013. 12 or 13 they did another the extreme deep field and then there were all those ones from the frontier fields followed by the good survey i forgot to mention that the good survey look this this is hubble looking all over the sky now at blank spots and imaging for a very very long time multiple days and seeing these very very distant galaxies and um uh so i want to i want them to do that with hubble uh i'm sorry with jwst um, where is it here? Here, let me just show you this real quick. Um, so here's the difference, right? So here you see, um, uh, a disc, these arrows will point to how far back in time the two, the two telescopes can see this is HST and it's the farthest the Hubble space telescope has ever seen into the universe is about a billion years after the big bang. Uh, right in this region here, and it did that with the goods survey. Chandra has also looked like they're in x-rays, um, but JWST is going to go even further. It's going to go all the way out to, um, to about 400,000 or so years after the Big Bang. Uh, I'm sorry, 400 million years after the Big Bang, 300 million years after the Big Bang, and see the very first stars and galaxies that ever formed so that's that's how that's the difference now what i want to see is that deep field that's what i want to see all right right now the deep fields we're getting are here about a billion years after the big bang i want to see this deep field <laughs> you know what i you know what i predict i predict we won't see a galaxy an image filled with galaxies i think what we're going to see is sparsely populated galaxies that are weird looking they're not going to look like galaxies. They're going to be blobs, you know, just kind of these weird blobs back then because the first galaxies were very irregular. These were the first things that formed from the very first stars that ever formed. <laughs> so they're just getting started. And now in the present universe, if you look now and today, all of our galaxies, most of them anyway, are these nicely defined spirals, the really strong shape. They've been sculpted by gravity. Some of them have been sculpted by gravitational collisions, or, or I'm sorry, galaxy collisions um, with each other. And they've made these elliptical galaxies, which are just big orange blobs. These are the oldest galaxies that we know about. So um, so everything in this epoch of the universe is very 
structured. It looks very nice. It's got nice shapes to it. But these first galaxies are going to be weird looking and odd and, and misshapen. And uh, that's I, so that's why I want to see that deep field. And I know it's coming. You know they're going to do it. So um, that's what I'd like to see. Um, okay. Uh, do we know if TRAPPIST-1 is going to be the first thing James Webb is going to take a look at? No. Uh, I don't think it is. Um, we're going to do a stream on this. Uh, cycle 1 observations. We're going to look at the very first thing uh, that um, that Webb will look at. I'm sure somebody somewhere has done an article on this. Let me do a quick search. So JWST first observations. Uh, let's see. Scientific American. Which do I want to look at? Let's look at ESA's website. Uh, selection of the first James Webb General Observer Scientific Programs. Let's see if we get a quick answer in this. A uh, total of 1,200, almost 1,200 proposals were received. Uh, scientists from 44 countries applied. 6,000 observing hours made available. Um, now it doesn't say what it is. Okay. So uh, will it take six months? Cycle one. Here's it. Let's look at this. Space Telescope Science Institute operates web. So they're the ones pointing it at things. And right now it's website. <laughs> is bogged down <laughs> oh dude you guys didn't get your server upgrades man uh so um all right let's not look at this <laughs> oh man i totally messed up oh there oh no there it goes okay um so so here it's it, this is all it's called cycle one these are all the observations that are going to get used uh, and it details how it spent the hours, small, medium, and large programs. Um, it's not done chronologically, though. Uh, so I don't know. Like, it's broken up into what they're going to look at. So you were asking about TRAPPIST-1. So let's go into exoplanets and disks. Uh, these are, these are they have uh, ID numbers. These are going to be the numbers of which they observe with. Uh, I'm just doing a quick scan to see if I see... Um, Trappist one, I see uh, WASP 121 B. Um, that's going to be looked at. Uh, let's see, uh, HD 2068 That's going to be looked at. Um, let me see here. Uh, poof. Here I are. I'm looking. I'm looking. I don't. Here, let me make this bigger so you can help me look. Um, this is the first cycle of, of things that are going to be looked at with um, with web on exoplanets. Uh, let's see, exploring the nature of the temperate exoplanet, K2-141b, TRAPPIST-1, there you go, probing the terrestrial planet TRAPPIST-1c for the presence of an atmosphere. That's in, uh, sci that's in observation 2420. Um, so there you go. Let's, let's see if I can click on it and get some... <laughs> His website is struggling, man. It's like, oh my god, people are visiting our website. Uh, anyway, there you go. They're gonna the one of the first ones that I saw, and you just saw me scan through this. Uh, it's gonna be uh, Trappist One C, um, probing the terrestrial planet Trappist One C for the presence of an atmosphere. Uh, and there's the program contents. There's a PDF here. Let's go ahead and click on that. Um, these are all the people working on it. Um, I'll read you the abstract, and then we'll we'll move on. Since the discovery of the first exoplanets, a prime aspiration has been the characterization characterization of planets akin to our own Earth. JWST will, for the first time, enable observations of the atmospheres of terrestrial planets, allowing us to understand the nature and diversity, and ultimately the habitability of Earth-like worlds. Facilitated by the broad spectral coverage of near spec uh, prism. We propose to characterize the atmosphere of the terrestrial-sized planet exoplanet Trappist 1c, which is one of the very first, is one of the most favorable such targets due to its significant transit depth and proximity to Earth. The seven terrestrial planets in the Trappist 1 system receive between 0.1 and 4 times the irradiation of Earth, and thus form a unique natural laboratory for testing and understanding planetary environments, their composition, and their habitability. Planets B 
D, E, and F are part of the GTO programs and observations of planet C will thus allow comparative atmospheric characterization of all the inner planets in the TRAPPIST-1 system. Our program will enable the detection and most and, and of the most probable types of clear atmospheres for TRAPPIST-1C and its atmospheric constituents. Distinguishing between a cloudy, hazy atmosphere and no atmosphere is extremely challenging for any terrestrial planet, including planet C, and will require occupying JWST for close to 100 hours. This ain't coming cheap, folks. Uh, we admit that the most fruitful use of JWST will be to reveal the clear atmosphere Earth-like planets early using short visits like this proposal, enabling groundbreaking exhaustive characterization of the most favorable Earth-like planets with clear atmospheres before the end of JWST's lifetime. And there's a description of how they're going to observe it. A uh, hundred hours. That's impressive. So we're going to go through this, folks. I'm going to go through this a lot more with you point by point but uh this is if you want to see this all for yourself go to the space webs or, or the uh, uh space telescope science institute and look at their cycle one proposals this is all the first year of observations with the james webb space telescope um and uh it's broken down by type of observation but not by when it's going to do it um, so we will have to, I'll have to go looking through this, uh, to see, there's an abstract catalog. Let me click on this real quick. If I can get some kind of, uh, uh, chronological listing of when these things are going to occur. This website is, <laughs> I feel for a man there. Those servers are honking right now. <laughs> They're like, whoa. Oh my God, we're being swamped and this is Christmas day. So <laughs> that's crazy. Oh, uh, all right. So what is this? What am I looking at? Abstract catalog. Uh, I don't know what this is. This looks like one fourth. It again, doesn't appear. <sighs> okay. Well, I don't know if this is listed in order of when they're going to do this. Um, you see here a scientific category. Maybe you can't. Let me see if I can make this bigger. So there's a scientific category here. This one's called solar system astronomy. Uh, this one is galaxies. And you can see the ID, the observation ID here. This might be it. This might be the chronological order of when it's going to be looking at things. So the first thing, if it is, if I'm right, and this is a chronological order, then the first one will be ID 1424, looking at gas giants um, by these people here. University of Leicester, our good friends in the UK. My wife would kill me if I said Leicester. Um, well, let's see, we propose a non-disruptive target of opportunity proposal. So yeah, this might be it, but I don't know. Um, I'm, I'm going to need... You guys are catch me off guard on that one. So I may have to, I have to read this and see. The way that they decide, you know, when to point the Jane Webb Space Telescope depends on where it's going to be in the orbit. What they want to do is align all of the, so, so they so they have this time allocation committee. They decide who gets observing a time and how much. And it looks like the unit of observing time is hours. In Hubble, it's orbits, which is 90 minutes. Um, so you get so many orbits of time on Hubble. Here, you're going to get hours on JWST. And it's going to be traveling around the sun, following the Earth at the L2 point. Now, where in the sky it's pointing is going to dictate what's going to be observed then. And they want to be smart about it. They want to pick a spot, and then they want to move to the next observing thing that isn't far away. Because remember, fuel is an issue. They don't want to be wasting fuel. They've got to last five, maybe hopefully 10 years worth of fuel. So they want to, they want to pick all the observations that they've approved in a in a logical way that minimizes um, the switching of filter wheels or moving of 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 any kind of mechanism and, and also using any fuel. And that is what's determined the order of the observations. Nothing else. They've already decided what we're going to look at through cycle one throughout the whole year. Presumably that's one cycle. Uh, and they've already, already decided who's getting observing time and how much, and then they're going to be smart about, well, okay, 
like right now, it's on its way to the L2 point. What area of the sky, when it gets all set up, is going to be available to it? And compare that with the observations they've already approved. They're going to look there. And then they're going to pick the next one. Well, what's the next closest one we can do with the least amount of uh, wear and tear on the space telescope? That's how they decide the order. And then, um, so w hopefully, I think this um, this catalog might be it, the abstract catalog, but it might just be a catalog. I don't know if it's in any kind of chronological order. Um, there must be a place at the STSCI website that has what is Webb looking at now. And um, I'm sure we'll we'll be able to learn that as we go. And that's got to be, because they do that with Hubble. Hubble has a thing that tweets, you know, what it's looking at right now. And that's pretty cool. So I, I hope they'll, I'm sure they'll do that with JWST. So, um, all right. So apparently I didn't get Pyro's question, right? Uh, my question was about making the sun shield big enough. Think observing sun's Corona during lunar eclipse that we could look around it. Um, solar collectors would thus be attached to the shield itself. Um, making the sun shield big enough. Think observing runs observing sun's corona during a lunar eclipse that we could look around it solar collectors would have that's have to be attached to the shield itself um i just don't think there's any desire to look around that sun shield i just don't think anybody even wants to think about it so um i, I don't know maybe i'm missing maybe i'm missing something um yeah it was a it was a beautiful a beautiful thing to watch so um there we go uh, Justin, thank you for this kind comment. Your love for astronomy is infectious. You do a great job communicating it. You have always been talking about JWST for so long, and I'm so happy for you all and astronomy lovers on this day. Thank you, Justin. Yes, this is, well, hopefully you're an astronomy lover too. You wouldn't be here otherwise, right? So good on, good on you too. Uh, so yeah. Um, how long will it take for JWST to fully deploy and start taking images? 29 days, 29 days. So we've got a month. Uh, to get this. Um, and uh, is this the guy that did the deep field video? Yeah, Rhett, that's me. I did it in 2006. I had a MacBook Pro with iMovie, and I wanted to see what it could do, and I made that. So thank you for joining. Um, what am I going to eat for breakfast? I'm having pancakes, man. I'm about to go get some pancakes. Oh, man, I, I'm gone a little bit longer than I, I said I would. I got to... Um, I had to, you know, this is a family day too for me. So I have to be um, conscious of people uh, coming over and stuff. I hope you guys are having a good holiday, by the way. Um, it's a great way to spend Christmas, in my opinion. I can't think of a better way to do it. And and this has been a flawless launch. I haven't been listening to the thing. So hopefully no disasters have struck. The next big thing is going to be an orbital correction in 12 hours. Uh, well, more like maybe 11 hours now. I don't know. They're going to fire it to get it to L2. Um in just the right, uh, just the right trajectory. So that's coming up in 12 hours. Um, so here's, here's my plans. Um, uh, here, here are my plans for, uh, streaming in January. A lot of it's going to be JWST stuff folks. So I do try to, I stream every week on Tuesday and Thursday. I stream on Twitch, YouTube, Twitter, and Facebook. And, um, Three o'clock Eastern time usually is when I stream. I stream for about an hour and I try to have something prepared to talk about, but I also want to, I want you to drive the conversation so we can uh, talk with each other. Um, the next stream, I think let's go through the observations. Okay. We'll get an update. We'll see where the mission is the next time we stream. Um, I wish I could commit to next week. I, I, it's a strange week for me uh, because I don't know what's going on. Oh, I have, I have some sad news. I'm going to share this with you because you guys are, um, you guys are my friends and, uh, Panther is not doing well. And my Panther's my dog and, uh, he's, he's got hip dysplasia pretty badly. So, um, he's taking up a lot of our attention right now. So give him good thoughts. He's, uh, he's struggling and we're giving him a lot of attention and, and, uh, we're taking him to the vet on Monday and it's going to be a rough, um, rough, time for him. So be thinking about him. And I, um, I'm, uh, not sure about my streaming schedule next week, so I'm not going to promise it, but the first week of January, I'll be back. And so I think maybe that Tuesday, 
on the first week of January, I will we'll go through the uh, observations and we'll look at, we'll talk about some of the more interesting ones and when they might have, I'll try to get a better idea of when these things are going to happen. What's the order of these observations? And let's look at what's coming up. Okay. And we'll talk about the science of each of these. And then I might do, um, you know, hangouts on those observations and what we might hope to learn. Um, so there'll be, I might do that on, on Tuesday, uh, the following Thursday, let's go in depth into the, um, into the instrumentation on JWST, what exactly are the four instruments and what will they be doing uh, exactly? And we'll we'll talk about that a little bit. Maybe we should switch those, the order of those two hangouts. Might make more sense to do that first uh, and then do the observations next. But that that's the, that's the feel of it, right? So those in the coming 29 days, um, if anything amazing happens or hopefully not catastrophic happens, we'll, I'll break in, we'll do a live stream together and talk about this. I would encourage everybody to join the Discord server. I hope I put a link in the description box. I've had to recreate this event so many times. I don't know if I put it in there, uh, but I have a deep astronomy server on Discord. I'm on it. All, I'm, I'm, I have it up on my t t uh, screen all the time. And if you ping me, we can talk about things. Um, I, I will also be uh, plugging. I didn't today, but I, I usually will plug into that voice channel so you can join and talk to me directly and have it be in the Hangout if you are so inclined to do that. So please join the Discord server. Um, and uh, somebody's already, <laughs> Mike Ake, he's tried to do the uh, Discord thing and it didn't come up. I don't think I've got that uh, on on Twitch. So sorry, uh, I need help setting that up, I guess. And Dr. Teeth has also done that. <laughs> um, I did. I saw this last night. That was an awesome movie. If you, It's on Netflix now. Watch it. It's a great I came away from that movie feeling good. <laughs> it was like, finally, someone is talking about the things that I think looking at the world the way I've been looking at it. This is like, if you don't know what it is, it's about two astronomers trying, it's kind of a comedy, uh, trying to convince the world that the, uh, that a comet is about to hit us. And, uh, oh my God, it's hilarious. I want to talk about that, that Ariana Grande, Grande song, uh, just had me in stitches uh the uh the lyrics to that so uh we could talk about that at some point but yes i did just look up folks just look up okay <laughs> if you don't know what that means watch that show um uh but i loved it um <laughs> uh so let's see yes the more stream the better right now i'm committing to tuesdays and thursdays i'm also producing space junk podcast so please uh subscribe to that on your things it's on all the the podcast places dustin and i just posted a video or i'm sorry an episode on wednesday about jwst where we talked about it together uh and another one's coming up next week so um so uh please uh please check out my podcast my my efforts right now uh in creating online content are these streams twice a week and Space Junk Podcast. I'm not really doing anything else. Um, everybody else, there's a lot of great producers of videos. I would encourage you to check out Launchpad Astronomy. Uh, that's Christian Reddy's. He's probably streaming uh, concurrently with me. Um, uh, so please subscribe and check. He makes videos uh, regularly. There's also Anton Petrov who does videos, I think, every day. Uh, so he is a big, you know, he's, you already know about him. He's got like a million people doing his stuff. Of course, you know all the biggies, Scott Manley and... Uh, uh, event horizon guys all those guys uh, are producing a lot of great content me i'm i'm more you know i'm more interested in this connection i like to stream this is what makes me happy way better than making and posting videos um because uh, i like this i like the fact that we shared this together on christmas morning and that i can see my friends online you know there's peter there's there's galaxy uncle bill's probably around somewhere uh you know ebone and and uh Jimmy D and, and Dan, you know, Dan, uh, Dan H, all of you guys, I feel like I know you because you guys all show up at all my streams. I know where you're from. I know, I know some of the things that interest you. Um, Jimmy D is all, you know, he's from Australia. Sometimes, um, we have Zoran joining us also from Australia. The, I just love this. So this is what drives me. This is what makes me go. And so I'm putting almost all my in, energy in this, except for the space junk podcast, which is the one thing I do that isn't live. So, um, so please, uh, please look for these streams. Even, even though I don't have the, uh, 
event posted in enough advance, the reason for that is I probably haven't decided what I want to talk about yet. And sometimes I don't decide that until the day of it. Um, but every Tuesday, Thursday, three o'clock, that's going to happen. As soon as I figure out what the event's going to be about, I go ahead and post it. But I don't off often know until just before it happens. So expect it on those times. Twitch, if you're on Twitch, I'll do that. Twitch, YouTube, Twitter, and Facebook. Um, I also do it on Odyssey, but nobody's on Odyssey. So, you know, it doesn't, Odyssey is just a blockchain version of YouTube, which I'm hoping will take off, but it so far hasn't. So um, um, anyway, I'm, I'm, I'm active on that platform as well. Um, so um, maybe a couple more quick questions and I'm out of here. Um, question, have you guys heard uh, of the Life Beyond series? His latest video, number three, is quite relevant to some of the potential work that James Webb may be doing, uh, masterfully crafted works of visual art. No, but that, thank you for the, re I don't know about that, but thanks for the reference. I'll check it out. Um, <laughs> Anton dubs out a lot of great content. He does, man. The guy works hard. So, I mean, he's, he deserves all the, all the, the, uh, uh, stuff you could you could want um good stuff too uh christian and anton are awesome dr becky too that's right i should mention dr becky definitely check her out a lot of these guys are doing great work so um i don't know i just don't feel like i have much to add to the conversation in that i did space fan news for a long time and that was gratifying um but um to be honest uh, youtube just makes it so that i don't even want to post anything anymore uh so this is this is better um so Simon Farmer is commenting somewhere out in the red shift. Six Quasar is about to be caught with his pants down. That's right. <laughs> there you are, Uncle Bill. I knew you were there. Welcome, buddy. Um, Uncle. Uh, so Space Junk is great and keeps getting better. Thank you, man. Where I'm working pretty hard at. I'm hoping Dustin and I can. We got a couple of format changes coming up in 2022. Hopefully you'll like those as well. Um, yeah, man. Panther. Thanks for the thoughts, man. I appreciate that. Panther. He's a good little doggy. He's had a hard life, that dog. When we got him, he was not in good shape. So he's had a hard, hard life, that guy. Um, so uh, thanks for that. Uh, will there be fields in which the upcoming ELT in Chile will be better than James Webb? Um, sure. Yeah. There's a, The things that the ground-based telescopes are going to be great at that, um, that Webb isn't is going to be uh, multiple long-term observations. Because Webb is so oversubscribed and its time is so limited in space, you need to get to the things that only Webb can do. They're one-shot observations, most likely. 100 hours. I couldn't believe that one was 100 hours long. That's a lot of time. So, But we want to know, right? TRAPPIST-1C, we want to know if it has an atmosphere. So there's an idea of what it's going to have to go through. 100 hours of observations for TRAPPIST-1C. Um, uh, but the extremely large telescope in Chile uh, will be able to see a, a lot of things, but it won't see anything in the wavelength range that Webb is looking at. See, that's another reason why Webb is in space. That's another reason why it's all, uh, infrared. ELT will be able to look at things in optical and some of the areas in uh, some infrared bands. But the atmosphere is very opaque to anything past ultraviolet or in the ultraviolet and up and anything in the near infrared all the way down to radio. It's just you can't see anything because of the atmosphere. So the ELT will be optical and near infrared. And um, it will see a lot of optical things better than um, than what James Webb can do. The thing about it is optical wavelengths aren't interesting in the early universe time frame. Right? You're going to be able to get with ELT some great optical pictures. So what can you do on the ground with these very large telescopes that you can't do in space? You can look at large areas of the sky, wide fields. And you can do it for a very, very long time, meaning years. We can go back to the TRAPPIST system and look at it for year after year after year and get very precise measurements of all the orbits. Think about it. In order to have discovered Earth from far away, and if you, depending on your orientation to the sun, you may not, you could be observing our sun for up to 364 days if you're unlucky and not see anything until that 365th day rolls around and you cross the, the limb of the sun. Then you're going to suddenly see a dip in brightness. Oh, there's a planet there. That's the earth. And so you need to look at things for a very, very long time. You can't do that with a space telescope. You because it's so oversubscribed and busy and it's got a limited time. and uh, But you can with ground-based telescopes. 
So you can see those dips in brightness, right? You can you can see the wobbles of these planets uh, as as it looks uh, as the, as the planets tug them around. So um, will it be better than James Webb? No, but it will be different. Um, and because it will not, James Webb is going to be seeing things it just can't see because it's in space. All right, guys. Um, I keep saying I'm going, but then I keep reading comments. Uh, uh, let's see. Yeah, don't look up. Definitely look. Give, if you got Netflix, uh, give it a treat and watch it. I th it was one of my favorite. <laughs> it's one of my favorite movies so far this year. I love it. Um, okay, so let's see. I'm just uh, Planet Hunters and. Uh, Got you. Zooniverse is a way for everyone to experience that. Um, that's a citizen science and in, uh, initiative, at least Zooniverse is. Um, so let's see. <laughs> oh, a lot of people are ramped up about it. Don't you worry. It just happens to be Christmas Day, and we all got other things, unfortunately, we got to do. Um, this is a good sentiment, Kenneth. Um, if the sky calls to us, if we do not destroy ourselves, we will one day venture to the stars. Did you guys see the uh, trailer for James Webb? They had Carl Sagan on it, of all people. So that was that was beautifully done. I recommend. Um, I, I I recommend checking that out. Okay, I will leave you guys here. Um, I'm going to stop my stream. Thank you all so very much for hanging out with me today. The Webb Space Telescope is on its way. Uh, it was a flawless launch. I don't think I've ever seen, even when I watch SpaceX do stuff, I don't think I've seen a more effortless <laughs> looking thing. And that's how you do it, right? That's how NASA rolls. NASA has embarked on one of the most ballsy missions it has ever embarked on. This is the hardest thing I submit that NASA has ever done. And so far, it's making it look like a cakewalk. And we all know it wasn't. But this is a very amazing and difficult mission hats off to nasa isa for the great launch and all of the uh, other collaborators canada uh, all of the people who contributed to this mission we're looking forward to a lot i can't believe that we're finally here um and if you ever let well the next 29 days are going to be nail biting to, to be sure but let's keep an eye on join let's we'll we'll meet on tuesdays and thursdays in the coming weeks and we'll talk about how things are going and um, let's remember that when you when you think about NASA's, you know, we all criticize NASA, myself included, but I can't do it today because this, what they've embarked on, what they've chosen to do is among the most difficult things we've ever done. The cost and the stakes have never been higher. If any part of this mission, if this mission fails, NASA's NASA or science direct mission directorate can be set back 20 years. This is Thomas Rebuchan's own words. We saw him earlier. Um, so the stakes are high. Hats off to NASA for doing this. ESA, congratulations on an amazingly smooth launch. You guys are rock stars. And let's keep an eye up for the next several weeks for the deployment. We've got a lot ahead of us. Go to jwst.nasa.gov and look at their deployment explorer to see what is coming up. There's videos that show you what the deployment will look like. We will be touching base and checking in on all of these milestones as they occur and as it goes on its way to L2. We are embarking now on a new era of exploration in for humanity. This is for all of us. And we're going to learn things about the universe that we can't even imagine. We, we're going to answer, we're going to have questions we don't even know that we wanted to ask and we're going to learn things that we didn't even realize we needed to learn from this mission just like hubble did for the 31 years giving us new surprises new revelations about our place in the universe jwst will take that mantle and move it forward in the infrared and we will learn more about the early universe and life in the universe than we've ever known before and so I'm excited about our, our time coming up. The next five to 10 years are going to be filled with discovery and amazement. And I want to share it all with you. Merry Christmas, everybody. Thank you so much for watching. And as always, keep looking up. I should start saying just looking up. <laughs>